presentation. Thank you, Cynthia. It was a beautiful introduction, very, very nicely pointed, elegant. We, we love to hear you discussing biomechanics because we always learn and get inspired. And the, the issue is that TBI is not pentachem bad D plus CBI. So the, 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 the TBI is a, goes beyond on the artificial intelligence, but some of the cases with astigmatism, they have different abnormal shape. And that abnormal shape will give us a higher weight into the artificial intelligence algorithm. So when you, when you get these cases, I always think I want to see these cases in the new algorithm that I'm just presenting you. So the point is that we have to take a look at case by case. It's not easy to give a general answer for that exact question. That was a very good question. And I think also we... Uh, actually, we have a question here. Just Is this possible to get the, the, the pool? So you can you can answer that on the on your cell phones if you have logged in. So considering our mechanics uh, in the property of evaluation. Okay, so that would be the question that I would say people would uh, respond to that. So think about in your minds what you would respond now, and eventually at the end of this talk, how would you respond it later. So my talk is the integration of the TBI with the new algorithm with the big data, and I see many of the colleagues that collaborated with the big data, and I thank all of you, and we can get even larger data based on some conversations just had, and this is always welcome. It's been a pleasure and an honor to collaborate with, with Oculus for many years. This is my financial disclosure, my colleagues in Brazil, and I'd like to especially acknowledge my, my colleagues in the brain group, especially the Leuza Leon, who did the great work. So the quest for enhancing diagnosis of ectase is that we have to go beyond beyond but not over, beyond but not over what? Detecting mild ectasia and also detecting uh, it based on topography. We have to understand the need to characterize susceptibility because any cornea pretty much can decompensate based on the impact from the surgery and also eye rubbing and the corneal resistance. So I highly agree with the hypothesis of Cynthia that biomechanical is the first possible thing that we can detect before the decompensation cycle occurs. Of course, before biomechanics, we have genetics, and maybe it's going to be the next future for that. But today, we've, with imaging, we are seeing secondary response, even on the epithelium, but the biomechanics is the first way of looking into that. So we, we have a, a, a huge work to teach people not to rub the eye, because that's the very first thing we can do to help people not to have ectasia, especially after LASIK. You know, we have to tell people that have lasers that they may have some dry eyes and they should not rub the eyes. Ectasia was first described by Seiler, and those two papers, they allude to the pathogenesis of ectasia, the first three cases on ectasia after high myopic LASIK treatments, and then the form fruits keratoconus case, so-called form fruits with abnormal corneal topography. So it's the impact from the surgery and the weakening from the cornea, the innate properties, and how to characterize ectasia susceptibility. I was fortunate to train with Steve Wilson, who did his work with Kleist when he was a fellow as well in topography, and we, we learned from, from the topography work that topography is able to detect abnormalities in patients with 20-20 best correct with normal slit lamp, but the fellow eye of this patient, and you can call this uh, unilateral, or but I would say it's an opinion from for myself that unilateral keratoconus does, is a misleading term, but it's very asymmetric, which is a fact. The fellow eye of this patient tells the story that you have to go beyond. Actually, the fellow eye of this patient, based on Kleiss editorial in the BJO, BJO in 2009, this is what we call as uh, a form fruits keratoconus. There is no consensus on what is form fruits keratoconus, and in my view, keratoconus uh, form fruits is the patients with high susceptibility. And what we are trying to understand based on in the, the evolution on imaging is that tomography goes beyond topography. This is a patient that developed ectasia after LASIK. The patient has abnormal bad D, low art max. So it's a patient with susceptible detected based on pentacam. In another world, you have a patient uh, with an abnormal topography that did LASIK and is still stable. And this patient is still stable over 10 years of follow-up, and the bad D that was 
retrospectively calculated is, is normal. So we, we just shown enhanced sensitivity and enhanced specificity for the tomography. However, when we, we see this, that you have some of the cases with uh, foam through keratoconus with stable corneas and some cases with normal topography that develop ectasia. This is based on the very nice uh, uh, collection of cases done by Steve Schauhorn in his series on uh, Optical Express here in Europe. But the conundrum is now 20 years old. We have to understand that ectasia is rare because of the technologies we have to screen and also because of the technology for doing LASIK. And in the 10 cases out of over 30,000 LASIK series, we have very difficult time to pick up what is going on to predict ectasia. So it pretty much makes the point that we have to go beyond. We have our own series of ectasia, 105 cases with a pentacam pre-op, and you see the PTA, the residual stromal bed and age cannot describe the, the difference between, even though it's statistically different, there is no ability to have a good separation in those models. Even the bad E here in this series is 59% sensitive, and Bernardo Lopez did a great work on the understanding of uh, artificial intelligence for the tomography with the uh, Pentacam Random Forest Index, we have a very good separation, but we need to integrate that with age, flap thickness, ablation, so that we can get a susceptibility score. However, some of the cases are not predicted, and that's when we go to biomechanical properties. And I remember well when I was squeezed in the corner of the Oculus booth, so that they were showing me the first of this cornea dancing things, and you have here a very abnormal cornea, a very thin cornea with a mild keratoconus and a patient with the opposite of keratoconus, which is ocular hypertension. But we have to get numbers. Numbers is what we have to get from an objective data. Otherwise, you see that dancing of the cornea, you get a subjective feeling every time you see it. So you need to have numbers. And Cynthia just described beautifully all these parameters, the, the deformation amplitude, the velocity, the integrated concavity, radius, inverse radius, and the DA ratio. But this is going to be combined with the CBI so that we have a way of detecting keratoconus, clinical keratoconus. And I was very happy and proud and honored to collaborate with Paolo and Ricardo on the Troughton Award in 2017. Even the logo of our group changed when we had that situation to combine tomography and biomechanics based on Scheinflug. And this is the, the work that we've been doing for many years to understand this. And the integration of Scheinflug and tomography and biomechanics with the, uh, the display that we have with the TBI is a work that was brilliantly done by Bernardo Lopez as well, so that we have a random forest index that was published in the JRS a few months after uh, uh, Ricardo's paper. So the basic concepts is that we need to get objective parameters. We need to get objective parameters based on topography and tomography from the Scheinflug, based on the biomechanical factors. And we have here two of the most important papers that describe the stiffness parameter, as Cynthia just pointed out, so that we can get the tomography and the biomechanical parameters. But we have to think about the populations. If you train your system to detect clinical keratoconus, it will be very good to detect keratoconus. But we have to go beyond that. And the best population for that are the fellow eyes with so-called normal topography. Eventually, if you look at the subjective classification of this case, and this case will be not so normal, but they obey to a very strict rule on the key. KISA, less than 60, IS value, central K, and no pattern of keratoconus detected. So we get accuracy, ROC curves, and we do the combination. And we have the methods with different artificial intelligence uh, so that the random forest was the best one. We did use the leave one out cross-validation we have artificial intelligence compares, compared with the bad D, and we did a DI, which is an index for the bad D, so that it goes from 0 to 1 to facilitate the, the, the comparison. The CBI, uh, James Buren had a very nice contribution with the separation curves. And we see here that the random forest was the best one, and you can see the overlapping here of the bad D, even for clinical keratoconus. But when you see only those leaking cases here with the DI, but the CBI. So the bad D and the CBI is not a combination to get the TBI. It's much more than that. It's going on here in terms of artificial intelligence. You see ROC curves, the separation curves by Jens Buren, and we were very happy with this. However, we have to, to really test it. And after doing uh, 
integrated system like that, we have to look at how it's going to perform in, in external validation and clinical implementation. So we have studies done by many of the colleagues. I was very happy and honored to collaborate with many people. And Prema Padmada from, from India, she, she gave one of the very nice first series. And we have here some of the cases with very asymmetric keratoconus, with, which was not abnormal in the TBI. So we start seeing we have room to improve it and we have to improve artificial intelligence. And even though some of the cases with clinical keratoconus, they may have the diagnose, but probably if you look back, it's not exactly keratoconus. It may be an ectatic looking cornea, but not exactly keratoconus if you look retrospectively. But we, we kept the original classification. Uh, it was part of the, the study from uh, the validation studies, one of the series from uh, George Waring IV that did a very nice work with his fellow at that time who got the Colon Award last year. So this is a patient that taught me a lot in terms of uh, ectasia risk factors because this patient had LASIK only in the left eye. It was published in 2010. And if you see the, the current possibility of looking at the topography, it's very mildly abnormal. Tomography from the uh, topography from Placido and topometric maps from the shine fluke are pretty much the same. And if you see, the, the bad D is on the borderline as a PRFI, but when it goes to the combination, it gets really clear to see that this is abnormal weakened cornea. So it's a 2015 best correct, and that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. But we can go beyond, we can go to subclinical keratoconus in a twin, so the identical twins, Four eyes with the same genetics, same appearance on Placido and on Scheinflug, but all of the four eyes have abnormal uh, TBI. Ectasia can occur in only one eye, and this patient had all the tests done in the fellow eye by Dan Reinstein, and everything is normal. So this is very important to understand that ectasia can occur only in one eye. But the external validation studies, you have cases down here. And these cases down here, they concur with some other publications that we have sensitivities that are much lower than the original series. So in artificial intelligence, we have the room and also the obligation and the opportunity to improve it. And if you see the new populations and the first original populations, you see pretty much the same possibility to detect ectasia in the clinical cases, but if you see the very symmetric normal topography eyes, you see it much different. And if you see the situation, some of the cases were called normal topography and tomography and normal topography and tomography and biomechanics. So a lot of people were trying to select those cases and we can learn a lot from them. New artificial intelligence was created. The brain group did a lot of work on that. And this is something that we have to improve and we get good data, we, we remove cases that were not uh, with all the parameters. This is a train uh, a study with more than 25 days of computer work. It's over 600 hours of work. And this was something that we're able to achieve with this performance. So when we see here, you have uh, the pretty much a very nice sensitivity to detect the fellow eyes. And this is pretty much the same uh, uh, accuracy for the clinical keratoconus and the old TBI, but much better in terms of the sensitivity to detect the very asymmetric eyes. When you compare the ROC curves, the ROC curves are much better even for the clinical keratoconus, considering all cases, but if you separate just the normal topography eyes, you can see much better the separation with the new algorithm that we have here. The correlation of the TBI and the, and the new algorithm is pretty much there, but we see cases with high TBI and uh, uh, a low TBI and a high new algorithm, and no case with uh, uh, a low TBI, uh, uh, a low, a high TBI that has a low new algorithm. So it means that we are improving much, pretty much the sensitivity without sacrificing much of the specificity, but getting much more sensitivity in these cases up here. So in conclusion, we we have enhanced optimization which is possible and recommended for artificial intelligence. We have to consider external validation tests. We have external validation tests going on right now. And I invite you all that you have collection of cases, especially the pre-op LASIK stable or SMILE stable. Those are very important for us to enhance the specificity because that's where I'm concerned about if the new algorithm is gonna work for enhancing the specificity as well. And 
reversal engineering for the high cases with a new algorithm that's very high with finite element models. And I do believe that further improvements will be even possible for more data for epithelial thickness, axial length, and ocular wave from parameters. Thank you.